All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to SCA Coaches Corner. Uh, we've got an interesting discussion this evening. We're going to be talking about avoiding training mistakes and things that uh, new new fighters and people who are maybe been fighting for a while but decided they want to get serious about their training. They really want to get better, and uh, some of the things that they will often do that will waste their time will sort of set them in the wrong direction and ways that they can improve and actually choose the right direction and not waste their training time. So with us tonight, we have our uh, one of our coaches, Sir Bess from Eldemir, right there, and she's also producing the show. And then we have Sir Nicholas de, de, Belmont, de Beaumont, um, a new knight from Antier. Uh, it's been fighting for a while and did training as well. So um, welcome, Sir Nick. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yep, you bet. Uh, so one of the things that uh, – well, where are we getting some background sound from there? Um, okay, so one of the one of the things that we, we talk about this, and I know we've had a number of episodes where we've talked about specifically physical training uh, issues, but let's talk about this from kind of the very first step. Like you're thinking of getting started or you've said, okay, I want to do this. What is the very first step that we often take? And that's going to be um, generally, and I know I was like this too, First, my first, the first ingredient I had for baking the pie was eagerness. I was very exuberant, really passionate. Like I, this is what I wanted to do. I didn't even know what I was doing or what I was getting into, but all I had to hear was that there were knights and there was armored fighting, and I'm I'm in. I'm, I don't care. Never even saw it before. Just heard about it at like a local meeting and just said, okay, I wanna I wanna go. So we have a few points that were kind of kind of follow an outline, but it's sort of a relaxed conversation. And the very first point is not looking before you leap, which is, I guess, sort of the, the my first sin of saying, all right, I'm, I'm leaping regardless. Um, so what what are some observations that, that you two have, have seen from uh, people in their eagerness kind of jumping uh, before they look where they're going or, or uh, sort of initial mistakes they will often make? So I will say as a gym rat, I see this both in the gym and outside the gym. People come in and they do too much, too hard, too fast, and then it's sore and they don't like it and they hurt the next day. And so that's it. They don't want to do it anymore because it hurts. Um, so I would say overdoing it too much too quickly. And it could be overdoing it because you don't know what you're doing because it doesn't hurt when you're doing it. <laughs> You know, it takes soft tissue injuries, uh, 48 hours to show up. So it takes a while. So that's, that's where I would, I would go with Nicholas. Yeah. What have you got? What do you think? Yeah, I think kind of springboarding off that is, you know, people not even really knowing what it is that they want when they first get into it, whether that's fighting or training, they don't really have a goal vague or otherwise beyond just, you know, get fit or get good at swinging a stick or whatever. And so they end up just throwing into, you know, taking that eagerness and just throwing it in a million different directions without even really having a, you know, I'm going to go to the gym and I want to get stronger, right. A, a, a more, a more specific goal, or I want to be able to, you know, have better endurance. So a more, a more specific workable goal, and then that combined with that or the lack of that combined with all the eagerness means that they just end up doing, you know, a million different things and, and uh, yeah, get sore without necessarily knowing why or for what. Right. Yeah. The, the, in seeing many people come in, that eagerness tends to overwhelm them to the point where they don't, they don't, they proceed without having a plan it, or their plan is just simply, I'm just going to go a lot of practices and just, mm -hmm work as hard as I can in, in every practice I can get my hands on. And so it's, it winds up being kind of a throw a bunch of mud at the wall and see what sticks kind of approach. And it, I think the energy level is so high that it does cause the burnout. Um, yeah. And it, without having somebody who can walk them through, okay, well, here's what, here's a wise way to look at it, or here's what to expect. I mean, and every group's going to be different. You can, I think uh, you can have a group where you get a new person and they, they come out all exuberant. Maybe that group has got like seven or eight nights in it or, or more. And they go to a practice and they think, well, I'll just go and and, and I'll, I'll fight the best. And they, they will pretty much get beat up. 
Let's just put it that way. And it doesn't matter whether they walk away without being bruised or banged up. Uh, they're not getting hurt necessarily. They might be. But the thing is, is they go out and they face somebody who's so far above their own ability level that they just get demoralized. And this is, I know we've had uh, discussions about this where we're, we're talking about it from the, the standpoint of the experienced fighter who's now dealing with somebody brand new. How do you make it a constructive and positive experience for that new person? But now we're going to look at it from the new person's point of view of how do you uh, handle what's a good way of, of handling your practice and to make sure that when you're not setting yourself up for failure by just being so eager that you're going to go go after every, anybody and everybody and don't are not sure yet what to ask for or how to communicate what it is you're what you want. Um, and I think that getting a handle on on how your practice, the practice that's local to you works or it's kind of like having a roadmap and it's a it's a good thing to talk with people that are more experienced than you are and say okay how does this go learn learn about what you're leaping into um and you know you may find that your local practice there might be a better one that's maybe not quite as close that would be more constructive for you to go to because there are i hate to say it there are some kind of toxic practices out there yeah that can happen too but even within the practice that you have there can be people that are really great to work with and you might find somebody that says hey because you're where you're at i know exactly who you need to work with who's going to provide you some really good coaching um and you know i guess without uh, how, how would i say this you might think that going to a night for coaching is always the best route it's not always the best route there are some really good fighters who are knights that cannot teach or coach to save their lives and there are some people who've not been knighted that do a really good job at teaching basics at teaching you how to understand how fighting works you know they might not have won a crown or or, or be a knight even but they can guide you better perhaps than somebody who is belted and that's one of the reasons we actually started this this channel was to help everybody who's experienced learn to coach better so that new people coming in can have a better experience so yeah. um i'd say that this is first point of, of not looking before you leap uh and the, the follow-up point to that is or the second part of this point which is to create a, an effective trading program and that begins with with analysis and this is something that i think you can do right from the very get-go and that this helps blunt the super exuberant jumping in over your head and then getting way over your head to the point where you're drowned and you don't want to do it anymore either from what what best talks about which is you know you you go kind of crazy and you decide you're going to be the first one on the field and the last one off of practice and the the next day your your body is paying for it um yeah. and the, part of it is understanding where you're starting from and that might be what is your physical fitness level or what is your um athletic level what is your you know if you have an athletic experience or not i've seen a lot of people come in with zero no athletic yeah. background whatsoever and need to learn kind of the basics of how to how to move and and uh you know they, they have nothing else to connect to in order to sort of use as as a familiar point for their training so realize that uh if you're starting like that you're gonna it's going to take a little longer to, to go and realize that pacing yourself is going to be important. Um, don't try to, you know, learn to win crown in two weeks. Like it's not, not going to happen that way. Um, and as you do it, uh, to me, the recommendation would be, would be talk to as many people at your practice as possible, especially the people that you see that have traveled the path that you want to travel. And that could be even, you know, I'm not going to talk to, I shouldn't say not talk to, but learn from the people that are serious students of fighting. But if you're not ready to be that serious, find somebody who's who's taken on fighting the way that you want to do it and find out what they did and get them to impart their wisdom on you. Um, it's the social part that's going to do a lot here for helping you form your vision of what you want to what you want your fighting to be and, and what you're willing to commit to it as well. It can be intimidating when you show up to a practice and you run into to a night or, or an experienced fighter says, yeah, I'm at two events a month. I go to three practices a week. 
I never miss any of them. And you're, you're thinking, uh, I can't, I, I'm not ready for that level. <laughs> or, or an experienced player um, says, yeah, I'm at two events. Of oh, you get a little echo there. So what do you guys think about, about, uh, about talking to others and, and getting kind of a, a feel for how they've dealt with their fighting to learn lessons about how you should take it on? Um, so I think one of the things I kind of, uh, that, that you said earlier that kind of resonated with me was, um, people not necessarily having like an athletic background. Um, and that, uh, you know, if, if you're like a new fighter building that sort of physical literacy can be so key to making the rest of the journey easier on you. Right. So you're not learning every single physical action in the crucible of getting hit with sticks, mm-hmm. right? You can kind of learn them and practice them ahead of time in a safer environment, you know, like, you know, learning how to use your hips by doing barbell squats or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so you're practicing these physical movements. And so when you go to practice later and they say, Oh, well, I want you to pull your lat down like this and then cast your arm and you kind of step through pushing with your hips as you do that. And you kind of practice those things ahead of time. So that can help save you a lot of, you know, real pain along the way, as well as, you know, emotional pain and torment. And then yep. kind of off that, the physical literacy is the, you know, learning to learn. Um, and th- there was a question on Ask the Shiv page. Mm-hmm. I think it was yesterday about like, are martial pursuits outside of the SEA considered in becoming, when you consider somebody to be a knight? in the sea which is like honestly kind of a yes and no thing and it's like no no broadly but like no one cares if you're a, a black belt in bjj you know in the sea but that can inform how you know how quickly you pick up you know sea fighting our sport um and so it kind of helps you you know mentally structure out like what it is to learn of like, okay, well I suck now, but I'm aware of like why. And I kind of have already like an idea of what I need to learn Mm -hmm. broadly going forward. And that can help you pick like a good tutor too, is somebody who can explain core concepts rather than like what I think of like move set fighters, right? Like Mm -hmm. dudes that are like, Oh, well here's a combo a B X Y. And then you win. Right. right. Um, <laughs> and it's like, well, kind of, and that can be useful, but you should also know the why behind like why a combo works or like, mm-hmm. you know, th- those things and, you know, looking for mentors that can explain the why behind an action as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, sorry. That was a little. No, uh, you're good. Rambly, but that's, that's, that's right. kind of what's jumping to mind here. Yeah. Yeah. Does. Yeah. I was about to say, I think um, when people get into the SCA, they immediately think that they have to be strong. I need to lift all the weights all the time, a thousand reps. But really what you need to be able to do is if you're using a shield and sword, you need to be able to lift your shield and hold it and move it around a bunch of times. And as we've established in my previous episodes, a shield can weigh anywhere between you know, like say for like a small little buckler type thing say five to ten or maybe even 11 pounds so that's really what you need to be able to do for a long time but also do you really need to be able to do it for a long time so for example if you're at practice a practice will go for several hours so yes if you want to be able to practice for a long time you need to be able to hold a sword and a shield for a long time but in tournament, boats are really fast. Like, yeah. I think you guys can attest, like, if a boat lasts 90 seconds or two minutes and they're throwing, you're like, holy crap, I'm dying at the end of that fight. So being aware of what you need to do and how you need to do it and for how long you need to be able to do it for is important. Uh, and I think people forget that part. I, I also think that a lot of people feel that they – have to be cross country runners, say competitively in high school, Nick. Um, <laughs> Nicholas was telling us that he was a, before the show, that he was a competitive runner. So I have to tease him a little bit. But like a lot of people will say, you know, work cardio, work cardio. And as is usual on Coach's Corner, I'm the odd man out. I'm like, really? Do you though? Because if we look at bout, and if we're looking at singles fighting, a bout is very fast, you know maybe a couple of minutes, 90 seconds. So that's high intensity interval training that you need to do to be able to fight 
um, and tournament. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, if it's like me, if you're like me and it's Penzik, you're doing 110 minutes in, on the elliptical so you can last the entirety of the woods battle. Mm -hmm. So again, what are you training for? Uh, and when you, most people, when they start, they don't know what they're training for. They're like, to fight really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we'll get into that one in the next the next yeah. point about unclear goals of okay, it's pretty vague. I just want to kick ass. You know, <laughs> yeah, things like that are a little vague. We do have a, a, a comment here that actually speaks to what Bess was talking about here, and I'll just show this. Uh, and that is speaking of physical literacy, what are some gym exercises that are good to work on as a routine for your regular workouts? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we could do a whole episode on this, uh, answering this one. Um, but I think in put it in the context of what are some mistakes, I think what I've seen commonly is just what Bess mentions. I need to be strong. So now they go hit a weight pile and they start pounding out some heavy iron to, to build bulk or to build overall strength. Uh, and that can be, that can lead you the wrong direction. Um, yes, you might be eager and exuberant to, to lift a bunch of weights and be stronger, but is that really what you need? And and I think Bess put it really well with, you know, tournament fights being shorter. Obviously, I, I think stamina is one of those things that SCA fighting does need, uh, especially because unlike most other athletes, we are wearing a heavy suit on top of just our body weight. Yeah. Um, so that's that is something. And of course, yeah. showing up to practice, getting your armor on and, and fighting will start to build that stamina. The, Although if you're only doing it once a week, it's not going to do it very well. But, you know, I know that in the last 10, 15 years, they make the weight vests for, for people to go walking or even running in. Although I, I think that's harder on the knees than you need to. Uh, you need to be training. Um, but the idea that your body's getting used to carrying extra weight on it, uh, that is a pretty valid and well-proven uh, exercise. Some of the other ones I can think of, one of the ones in, in so Nicholas put this really well before we started the show is the, I wish I would have known this before I started category of, yeah. of knowledge. And one of the things that I wish I would have learned run into was uh, Indian clubs and using uh, these club swinging and they have Indian clubs are one club in each hand and it really works the small controller muscles of the shoulder and Indian clubs go back hundreds of years. And these were trained by, swordsmen essentially in india and in south asia to great effect and um and even wrestlers would get heavier and heavier ones and i mean these guys are really built but have, one of the things you've seen the hand, videos of the persian wrestlers using them now yeah the, the meals they, the, the really big ones yep enormous yeah, exactly. they, oh they're huge they're now, like 120 when you're pounds. wrestling you need a lot of a lot of chest and shoulder power um it's very useful in sword fighting though it's the sword the, mu the muscles that control the sword are the small ones and this is where if you start thinking oh i need powerful shoulders i'm going to start doing military presses and i'm going to start doing heavy shoulder so yeah, and you can bulk your shoulders up and build a lot of strength but that's not the muscle groups that are controlling how your sword gets thrown um you're basically missing the mark uh and that's going to be something to consider so i i would i do think working your legs at more for a stamina than raw strength like just doing power squats and things like that aren't going to be as useful as doing like lunges and and jumping um, what do they call them um long jumps and things like that especially side to side because you're a good fighter uses lateral movement probably even more than they use straight forward and back movement or should um so and this is where things like running are good to build your stamina and your legs but they're also usually when you're running you're only going forward so you're not building the lateral movement that is really useful for fighting um so yeah i'd, I'd say legs one of the things that will surprise you and this one did me and i still remember this to this day even though this was like in 1983 when i started the you're first old. time I went to practice i i was holding the sword so tight that when I took it out, my 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 hand just clenched up and it stayed that way. I had to kind of peel my fingers out because they were so I was gripping the sword so tight, feeling that I needed to 
because that's how we all start by using way more strength than we we should be. Um, but you'll find that your grip will get stronger because you know you you're having to use your grip when you roll when you roll the sword through your hand. You're using a lot of fore, forearm and hand strength, um, and you, you if you need to, you can start to build that too. Um, SCA fighting is a fairly specialized sport, so it does require some specialized training. And I would definitely point to anybody who's interested to watch uh, Bronis's Sunday practices uh, for what he, he teaches in terms of footwork, movement, balance. If you're going to work on something, one and only one thing, work on that before you, you're working on shoulders, arm strength, chest strength, grip strength really be able to move a, a good fighter needs to be able to move well and so that that would be the top of my list yeah. any other tips for uh exercises you two would recommend yeah uh so if somebody I, i'm gonna assume they don't have much time and they do mm -hmm. not have much equipment so just mm -hmm. starting there because I, I do feel like they're you know great exercises but if it does require specialized equipment it's kind of like right. you're already in a uh putting yourself into a box. Mm -hmm. But if, if you were to just practice sitting in a deep squat, every, make it part of your daily routine for five minutes, you know, while you brush the, your teeth or whatever, uh, or in the morning watching TV or something, just sit in a squat, practice stretching a little bit. And if you can't get in a deep squat, work on that, work on building that mobility. Um, that alone will be a great primer for a lot of other physical attributes down the line and uh on the opposite end of that just overhead hanging so mm -hmm. if you have a pull-up bar or a branch or whatever uh literally just dead hanging if you can't do pull-ups yet um and just learning that you know in a lot of ideal ways like a pull-up is just a high degree progression of a dead hang mm -hmm. um and like heavy squats and jumps start with learning how to just be in a squat. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have, don't have a lot of time and don't have a lot of equipment, just practicing sitting in a squat for five, five ish minutes a day and dead hanging for like five minutes a day too, something like that uh, can be a really great start um, down the road. I'm a big calisthenics guy and uh, I actually do a lot of um, strength and power rep range exercises, but I'll usually follow it up with a mobility routine, right? I'll warm up, you know, do my squats for strength or whatever. And then uh, I'll do a squat mobility routine right afterwards. And then, yes, usually my cardio is like pretty low impact, steady state stuff. Like I'll get a kettlebell and like swing it for like an entire podcast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or like I'll swing it for like, you know, an out put on an album and just start swinging for a while. Uh, so not, nothing super hard, you know, sometimes it'll be like 10 reps, set it down for a couple seconds, come back, do it again. Um, cause like you said, our, our sport is really high intensity and then a lot of standing around an armor, right? So like with big bear pit style or round robin tourneys where you, know, you have 20 fighters there, you'll end up standing around for an hour and a half just, and, and that alone makes it much harder to recover. So having that kind of grindy, it's not the same as running, right. But like, it's mm -hmm. a lot more like ruck, rucksack marching or like hiking or something like that right mixed with like suicidally hard intensity for like a little bit of time <laughs> uh, it's kind of how i think of it so kind of yep. practicing all these things but um yeah sit in squats practice squats mm -hmm. of all varieties yeah squats are great i agree so i will jump in and i i do want to clarify something you do need muscles so mm -hmm. you need muscles in order to be able to do our sport you can't do this without muscles but it's not for, but when you're starting, you don't have to jump into it. Um, lifting heavy weight. I mean, lifting heavy weights is great. I enjoy it. I'm not always great at it, but I enjoy it. Um, and for people who want to do it, must, you know, more muscle mass can, can impact the, the your ability to fight your power, your speed, but you don't have to, if you're just jumping into it. Mm -hmm. Nick gave some good examples of what you can do if you don't have a gym membership, if you don't want to invest in equipment, if you're not even sure if you really like this and maybe you're starting off, you know, you, you've done, I don't know, maybe you're a coach potato because you really like CSI or something or all the Chicago PD episode, uh, series out there. But you can do things at home. Uh, and I strongly recommend working, starting off really easy. It's easy to start off hard. 
I recommend that you work all your small muscles, your supporter muscles in your arms and in your knees. As Tristan commented earlier, most of our life is going forwards and backwards. You know, we walk forwards, we might back up a little bit. We don't do a whole lot of sideways stuff. So our knees are not perhaps as strong as they should be. As I found out at Benzik, our supporter muscles are not as necessarily as strong as we would like them to be. And honest to God, I have a dog down there. I need you to move. Move. No, seriously, move. Okay. <laughs> I just threw the out of the way. You can literally just make small motions like this, and this will work all the small muscles in your arms. After I uh, tore my rotator cuff, this is one of the exercises that they gave me for physiotherapy. I did that in 2008, and I continue to do it to this day uh, for both my arms. Uh, and you can, like, I make figure eights, and then I go figure eight the other way, but it's really harder. And th so that's just your small muscles. And if you're at home and you don't want to, you know, you're like, I don't really want to invest in weights because weights are stupid, or I'm going to, I'm going to join a gym. Uh, you can do things like a can of soup, uh, laundry, deter uh, laundry detergent, whatever you got for laundry detergent, it'll weigh about 10 pounds. And you don't have to do a lot. Like if you start off working your way up to 12, that's a set. Each one is called a rep or repetition. 12 is generally considered a set. And generally we say three sets of 12. That's generally what we say in the gym. And that's generally what we do. And once you can do three sets of 12 easily, you know, you're like, okay, my body's got this. I'm pretty cool with this. Then you can try to increase your rate, weights. At that point in time, get a bigger jar of laundry soap or something. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. But you can also, when you're making your circles like this, you can you can hold laundry soap. You know, I have a more forward stance with my shield. So I do. I practice holding things just out in front of me or even just my arm. When I'm in the gym, people give me really weird looks as I sit there for 60 seconds and do, you know, the two and a half pound weights this way and then two and a half pounds and I do them again. But they really do work your stabilizer muscles. Um, and as somebody who has suffered from, you know, blowing out, body parts i really encourage you to work on your stabilizer muscles once you're comfortable with those you know gyms are full of trainers and they're fascinated by what we do and they're really excited to help as i accidentally found out one day as i was telling uh one of the trainers in the gym just in chatting so i recommend you talk to them and i also want to say and we probably should have thrown this up in the very beginning I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on Chicago Med or any other TV program, nor our, our Tristan or Sir Nicholas. So please, if you're going to do anything that um, might cause you pain or unhappiness, please speak to your doctor. Doctors are super important and they can help you. Uh, if you learn something at the gym and you're doing it and it hurts, you know, you might want to talk to your doctor and they'll go, oh, yeah, because that's tearing your shredding biceps, tendons or ligaments. Uh, it sounds kind of goofy, I know, and everybody says it, and I'm a really good, horrible example, as anybody who watches the show knows, because I don't do that nearly as often as I should, but I'm getting better at it, but I really encourage the newer people to do that, talk to somebody who, who is in the sport, and I think Tristan said earlier, you don't have to be a knight. Um, we have all kinds of people in the SCA, physiotherapists, doctors, you know, trainers, uh, ask around people in the club know people because we've all gone through this before mm -hmm. yeah there's one thing that i that i have seen a number of people fall prey to uh and this happens not just in sca fighting but in a lot of sports <laughs> they want explosive strength like they want to be able to throw a really fast blow and they they as they start you know searching the internet and, or, or looking in exercise books they find what they call plyometrics and these seem to be like the holy grail of wow, I can suddenly ex be explosive in my running or my jumping or my sword shots. And a plyometric is exercises that are focused on building explosive strength. For example, like let's say you're doing a push up instead of taking the count of three or the count of five or six to, to push up, you explode off the ground and try to get your body as high off the ground as quickly as possible. And you can use this method for uh, jumps, squats, uh, side lunges, pretty much any exercise, it's you're just doing it explosively. And they think that's what I need. I need to be explosive. I need to be quick. And that day one, I'm starting right on that. And that's what I'm going to do. Well, 
plyometrics, yes, will build that. But if you don't have a solid mu a musculature built already through exercise of doing that exact exercise, you can easily tear your muscles up and cause injury and, and pain. And so for anything, anything you're looking to do from a plyometric standpoint, do at least six to eight weeks of that exercise under, you know, start at low intensity, get up to good intensity level before you even think about doing it. Because, uh, yeah, one of our, uh, you know, I'm going to throw this comment up because this is absolutely gold. That's a surefire way of, of uh, going and seeing a physiotherapist. Absolutely it is. And what we talked about earlier is getting so exuberant that you injure yourself and now you can't train. You're now bummed out that you made a big mistake. Maybe you, you know, other people at practice uh, are now wondering, well, where did they go? And now you're like hanging your head in shame. Like, I can't believe I just did this to myself. That's why we want to have this episode to kind of cover some of these mistakes that other people have made um, that stop them. And if you really love learning to fight, you don't want any reason to not be at a practice, whether you're uh, injured at home or, or, you know, blowing it off to, to eat cake and sit on your couch, whatever. Um, you know, you want to be able to attend the practice. You want to be able to get in, into the armor, uh, do the training. Uh, and you can't do that when you're injured. So yeah. take care of your body and, and, uh, and don't let your exuberance run away with you. Um, let's get to the next one, the unclear goals or objectives. And I think this is one of those that we touched on a little bit earlier with the, oh, I just want to be good. I want to, I want to be good. I want to be the best, or I want to, you can even say, I, I want to win crown, which at least that's kind of tangible. Um, although it may be so far beyond where you are that it's, it would be difficult to, to you envision the path of getting there. Um, I suppose kind of like somebody saying, I want to walk to Los Angeles. That could be like 1200 miles. You need kind of a roadmap to get you there. Okay, well, you're going to go there for there, but you're going to go, you know, to the next town first. Or you're going to go into across the street first. Um, and, and so I think unclear goals, and uh, there's a distinction between goals and objectives. And I, I guess many people can have their opinions of what those are. Um, a goal might be I want to win my first tournament which even that can seem kind of in the distance, but objectives would be, you know, maybe I want to learn to do really good leg shots. I want to be able to leg anybody at will, or I want to be able to uh, survive somebody swinging at my head for 15 seconds without getting one shot or two shot it or what have you. I need to build my defense up. I mean, there's a lot of these small objectives that go into getting you to that first goal. Um, thoughts on, on unclear goals? Yeah, so one that jumps out to me is that our sport and other passion sports in general don't really have a <laughs> – my kid's making noise in the other room. Um, he's 10 months old. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so they don't really have an end date, right? So when I was in high school running, it was, well, I want to get the best times I can before I graduate. And then mm -hmm. I ran a bit more in college, and that kind of stayed there. But I knew – I knew there'd always be an end date, right? A time at which I'm like, and then I can kind of take running way less seriously, right? And our mm -hmm. sport doesn't really have that unless we set that. Um, so I think it's important in a lot of ways to have more like strategic goals of, you know, because uh, even if your goal is like to win crown, so what happens if you win crown? Are you just done? Like, so what comes next, you know, in terms of like building fighting proficiency and, and our sport in a lot of ways isn't great at really codifying what it is we do in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, total knowledge base. And it's kind of good in that way that, that kind of helps it and hurts it in some ways. Right. But mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, one goal that I think would be good for like a new guy would be or a, a, a novice to intermediate kind of fighter would be never get killed by a shot that you don't know what happened, right? You should always know why you lost like a given mm -hmm. round, right? And that starts to focus more on like the kind of intellectual side of it and makes it less of a really intense physical goal, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, you yeah. know? Um, rather than winning or losing attorney, cause you know, we all know those can sometimes be a dice roll. Sometimes you just mess up and then, or, mm -hmm. or they just had a good day, you had a little bit of a bad one, but right. you know, making a goal a little bit more inside that. Mm -hmm. um, That's so two things. One, I'm just going to yell at my dogs for a sec. Excuse me. 
Glad I'm not one of your dogs. <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> when, the, when the big dogs start to play, it, it can get loud and jostle me around. Mm -hmm. So with regards to goals, one of the things that I would recommend is something that, God help me, we say at work. And goals need to be smart. They need to be specific. As Nicholas said, I, I want to be, you know, I want to win crown by the time I'm 25. Or I, or I think it was Tristan said, I, I want to be able to take leg shots. You've got to be able to measure it or quantify it. So, so what does that actually mean? Well, if it's, I want to win crown when I'm 25, you can measure that because you're 25. Did I win crown? Yes, no. But when it's something a little harder, like uh, I want to be able to take leg shots, is then then you have some issues. Do I want to be able to take, like, is that 100% of my leg shots are going to be good? Or is it that um, I want to be able to hit, oh, God, one in three? Uh, what is it that I want to do with legs? So you really need to be able to set not just the goals, but the variables around this. Because, you know, we're a highly everything in the boat can change. So 100% of my shots is not a realistic goal. So so that's that's part of it. Your goals have to be attainable. So you have to say, I can do this thing. So if my goal is to fight as, you know, six foot five, the reality is I'm not growing anymore. So that is a dumb goal for me and it's not attainable. The goals have to be realistic. And that's when I said, you know, if you want to do a leg shot, well then, you have to have a realistic shot, a uh, realistic goal. So I want to hit one in three. Well, in, bat, in in baseball, that would that would mean you're batting 300, and that would make you an awesome um, batter. So these are the things you have to take into, God help me, account, uh, because you have to have a realistic goal. So that's, that's super important, too. And always the T part of SMART is time-bound, as Nicholas was saying. You give yourself a deadline. Ah. I want to be able to do it by this time. That's super important. And it's to regularly reassess your goals. And Tristan, you said, well, I think it was you that said, what happens if I meet my goal? You also have to be prepared to update, modify, and, and find new goals. You, you don't just have one and stop, because if you have one and stop, well, that's it. You know, at 23, I was, I was a knight. Or not 23, 30, 33, 30, 30, 30, I, I don't know, some age. You know, I was a knight, I'd won coronet, now what? So you, you need to find new goals to, to help pull you forward. At least for me, I see my goals pull me forward. Absent any goals, I just kind of do the same old thing, and it's, it's not helpful for me. Right. Well, and then what you talked about actually feathers us into our next point, which is uh, not considering your practicalities or... or uh, if you're choosing goals that, that are not practical or realistic for you to get to, um, which can happen. And when you're, you know, in that exuberant mindset where you, you're thinking of, the, you know, shooting for the moon and the stars, uh, it you might be choosing something that's either too far away for you to keep the fire burning for the years it might take to get there. Uh, and like you talked about, there's the, well, what, what if you nail it? And then the, the second, the other side of that coin is what happens if you don't, are you going to be yeah. so depressed and dejected that you're going to say, well, I'm a failure and I'm going to quit. And you, you don't want to set yourself up psychologically for that mind trap of, yeah. you know, having everything hinge on that one, that one thing. Whereas, you know, anybody that's done, whether it's fighting or sports development, you know, they develop themselves as a, as a good athlete in their given sport. They realize that that progression is a series of small gains ever climbing towards an ultimate goal. And, um, you know, you might get half or two thirds of the way there and things in your life change and your priorities start to shift. And what was, you know, fire burning in you to do to go win crown is now changed into something else. And, but it's that, that progression that I think is the important part. And what do they say about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? This is one of those things you have to eat at one bite at a time. Just have the next thing that you want to be. It's always above where you are now. So you never want to get lazy. And so you want to make it practical, but, I assure you that, and don't think, well, if I'm not shooting for winning crown or, 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 you know, a major goal like that, that you're not getting anywhere. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, I've found that, that 
taking on a practical approach as opposed to the daydreaming type approach is far more productive because you get the, all right, I, I set up on doing this, this short-term goal like three weeks ago, and now I can see the results. Like that feels good. You're getting a better longer term dopamine progress than you would have. Well, it's been a year and a half and I yeah. still haven't won crown, you know, or two years or three years or how, you know, however long it takes. So, um, I would say that, that, uh, consider the practicalities, but, but make it that your path is, is giving you goals that you can achieve and you just never stop coming up with new ones. Yeah. Um, with barbell strength training, one of the, uh, things I heard a coach say that really stuck with me was you need to have a, uh, plowman's mentality about it. You need to have a very blue collar work ethic mm -hmm. towards your training, right? getting out every day or every other day and grinding towards your goal rather than the kind of, well, you know, we need to be training, not testing constantly. Right. So if mm -hmm. I want to get stronger and all I do is show up on Sunday and I deadlift a one rep max PR, at, you know, I do, I do like five times. And I try to do a one rep max PR, you know, maybe I'll get stronger super slowly over a long time, but probably I'm going to hurt myself and be depressed. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what I need to be doing is, three sets of five squats, deadlift and press three times a week. And it's going to be boring and it's not going to be sexy and it's not going to be glorious. You know, it's going to be less, uh, Instagram postable, right? right? But it'll be more honest and it'll make more gains in the long run. Yeah. Right. So rather than focusing on, you know, some grand goal focusing on like those small incremental ones, wh whether it's just like, you know, watch your practice video, which you should be filming practice if you're not, because it is super useful. Um, and then kind of add up your win losses, see what percentage that falls in and say, you know, I'm only winning 50% of my fights. We'll try to make that 50 and a half percent next time or 51%, you know, slowly mm -hmm. over time, or at least like, you know, I don't want to lose my fights in this way anymore. Right. I'm not going to get leg next practice or if you can, mm -hmm. right. Lower, lower the number of times you get legged. Right. And those very small incremental changes and in trying to, improve on those over time and really train rather than test. And that goes both for physical fitness training and for fight training. Mm -hmm. um, so consistency is the winner, not the, uh, the crazed single effort, <laughs> yeah. uh, no matter how much it feels like you're working hard because you are, but the consistent will be much easier and more easier in your body and more productive in the long run. Um, yeah. And you, I, I, you just brought up uh, filming yourself and, and, uh, and that actually brings up the next part, which is um, doing it all. Yourself. Oh, oh do you have one more? Yeah, I just, sure. wanted, I just wanted to add something. Uh, sure. Nick said, videotape yourself. Or sorry, I'm old. Uh, you know, film yourself at practice. I got to say, I think it's a really great idea. And once again, I'm a really good horrible example because I don't do that. Because when I'm in my body and I'm fighting, I'm like, oh, look at me. I'm so subtle. I'm terrific. I'm fast like the wind. And I look at me on video and I'm just like, Christ, I'm slow. I'm obvious. I'm clear. And I, I discourage myself. So don't be best. I, I really do need to do that a, a lot more often. So don't be me. That's really important. And I want to encourage you all, as Nicholas said, small incremental goals are really important. I know people say things like, Nicholas, you said go from 50 to 51. Everybody's like, that's one. One isn't very many. Yeah, okay, I can see that. But that's a 2% increase. And 2%, people say, well, that's not very many. But 2% is more than you were doing before. The concept of better is something that we should embrace. If you do 50, if you win 51, you are better than you were before. When I am you know, tired and fed up and I don't want to do another stupid thing around this house and the dogs are driving me insane, I do one thing. One thing. I like I look at it and I go, Bess, what can I do? And I wash, I wash a mug or not even all the mugs, just a, a mug. And it is better than before. Yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be better than before. And it can be a really, really small step. It doesn't have to be, oh, I'm going to do, you know, increase by 10% or 20% or 30%. And in fact, I would say those are unrealistic, unattainable goals. And you will discourage yourself if you do that. If you make, if you give yourself small, attainable goals, 
maybe not immediately, they take some work, but they are attainable, then, you know, uh, you can do it. Sometimes when I'm in the gym and I'm say I'm on the elliptical, I am dead. I'm ready to stop. I hate everything. That's it. The music isn't any good in my ears anymore. I'm sweating so hard that I'm disgusting. And I, I say to myself, can I do 30 more seconds? Can I yeah. just do 30 seconds? And then 30 seconds passes. And then can I just do 30 more seconds? And sometimes the answer is no. And you have to learn to listen to yourself and, and know what your boundaries are. But your boundaries are not always what you think they are. I, when I'm on the elliptical and I can't do another 20 minutes, like I'm like, no, no, I just, I've done enough. I can't do this. I can't do 20 minutes if I think about it as 20 minutes, but I can do 30 seconds and that's better. And then I can do another 30 seconds. I frequently say I pull myself along doing 30 second increments. I will also say um, with regard to practice, uh, like many of you, you know, I wake up early. I work all day. I'm tired at night. I don't want to go to practice. I'm tired and I'm fed up. I'm like, God damn it. One of the most um, motivating things I ever saw was something my gym posted. And it said, I really regret that workout, said no one ever. And so there are times when I drag my ass to practice and I'm mad. I'm mad the whole way I'm driving there. I don't want to be there. This is stupid. I'm going to go and I'm going to do one stupid bout and I'm probably going to lose it. And then I'm going to go home again. And this is stupid and I hate it. I'm quitting fighting because... I'm tired and I just want to stay home. But never in my life have I ever regretted dragging myself to those practices. Never in my life have I regretted, you know, doing the bout. And oddly, when I get there, I am willing to do more than one bout and I have more than one fight and I end up having a good practice. So one of the things we will be talking about is the mental side of it. But that is really an important component. And I just I just want to share that with you. So, Tristam, we're back to you now. Excellent. Um, yeah, those are good points. Um, one of the things as we were prepping for this show was kind of the idea that there are there's the physical and the mental side of these mistakes. And the we've talked about some of the physical ones where you jump in and you overdo it, you beat up your body, uh, and your body's not happy with you. Uh, but there's the mental part, too. And, and that's just touched on a number of those things. And we sort of mentioned these earlier too, of how do you demoralize yourself? And it is entirely based on what you set out for your own roadmap. If your goals are set too high or they're unrealistic, or you're not taking into account where, what your starting point is. Um, maybe you think you're more talented than you might be, um, or you just decide that in your ambition, you're, you're just gonna, gonna shoot for something that is as you go ahead and do it, for example, let's say you have a practice available to you three or four nights a week and you say, I'm going to go to every one. And then you find out after a week, week and a half that you're having trouble struggling doing it. And you say, you have to then say, well, I can only do really realistically do two a week. And then you say, I've failed. I've now, now you are um, basically turning yourself into your own enemy by uh, a sort of a negative dialogue with yourself saying well you you know you set out for this and you, you failed you suck um and the, the last thing you want to do is turn into your own enemy um <clears throat> and keeping keeping a a, a positive outlook and, and mental attitude with your training is is crucial the, the, you never look at somebody who's done this for years and has become really good has done that um you know they find some way to be mentally positive to be productive to look forward to going to practice um if you find yourself forcing yourself to to go to practice regularly you're probably going to burn out sooner rather than later um and one of these one of the things that actually brings up our next point which is I'm, and i'm glad that the the idea of videoing yourself got brought up too because it plays into this and that is doing all of this yourself feeling like you have to be your, your not only your the athlete you're the coach you're the trainer you're basically trying to do this all flying solo um it's kind of the old school way of doing it of just showing up sparring learning the hard way and just keeping at it but that is there are much better ways and getting help from others to do it is going to be invaluable it is going to save you so much time and heartache and wasted and uh wasted effort 
Um, and where this comes into the videoing thing, and I, and I do think that that videoing, your, videoing yourself and watching is helpful as long as you have an idea of how to do analysis. If you don't know how to do analysis yet, you're probably going to be frustrated because you'll watch those videos and you're like, I'm spending my time do, taking the video. Now I'm watching it. I don't know what I'm looking at. Get help. Get even somebody who's been fighting just a few years to give you some pointers about what you should be watching. Maybe how, how to teach you how to analyze fighting. And and I would do it live. Have them teach it to you by watching two fighters actually in front of you doing their fights. As a because video adds a whole nother layer of difficulty because usually the the most fighting footage is kind of crappy it's like two people off 50 feet away fighting and you can barely see anything and it, it's tough it's difficult to analyze it takes a very experienced eye to, to be able to make it out and even even they will say uh the video is just too too poor to uh, to analyze much you can do some but uh get with people locally and this kind of goes back to our previous point that can help you learn analysis uh Get them to anal watch you and analyze you while you fight so that they can say, all right, here's what you should be doing. It, it's cool if you ask your opponent those questions too, but a third third eye view of watching you fight can be invaluable. And um, you don't need the, the, the best fighter and trainer in the known world to give you good insights as to things you're doing that you don't think you're doing. And I, I, I'm with Bess on the same thing. I've, I've experienced exactly the same. Like, I know I don't do this bad habit. And then you watch yourself, you're like, oh boy, I do. <laughs> um, but definitely get the input from others uh, and then learn how to do that analysis yourself. And then those videos are gonna start to become more useful. Um, who, has, who has some points to add to that, to doing it I yourself? Mean, definitely having someone there like analyzing you in the moment too is mm -hmm. just super invaluable for being able to like if they need to call hold between bouts and correct a thing 10 seconds after it happened right mm -hmm. you know immediately or uh you know address a very specific you know shield position or whatever you know that kind of thing or even a tactical headspace so um and yeah like you said that does bring a richness to your videos when you watch them later right so somebody says oh when you use a heater shield the bottom edge of it's drifting out and that's opening up a leg shot you're like no it's not i hold my shield you know perfect i'm fine and then mm -hmm. you know they mention it they correct it and then when you do see it in the video you're like oh my god i'm like trying to spear them with the bottom of my shield <laughs> uh, so that that is a specific example that happened to me <laughs> about six years ago or something oh yeah um, but, uh yeah so yeah we all have them how about you Bess? anything any thoughts i think nothing that you guys haven't already said um and that i haven't said because god knows i probably said it so why don't we go on to our next point fair enough and i guess this one would be the um the the trap of the cognitive overload and this can this can happen where I would always see this was when you'd get a coach and I've, I've been guilty of this sin in, in the past before I really sorted out. All right. How do you be a good coach or a good trainer? And that is, you don't want to overload somebody with so many tips and pointers and things. You got to do this and not do that. And that it's, we call it in the in martial arts world, trying to drink from a fire hose. Uh, you just can't absorb anything when you're given so much. Uh, and this is a, a a coach's trap too, where even though you want to give somebody all the information that you can assess, they can't process it all. And so, you know, from the uh, student side or the, the, you know, the new fighter side, you will be faced with this sooner or later. It will happen to everybody. And you, it could even be self-driven. Like you might just sit down and write out a list of, I need to be able to do, you know, this or that, or I suck at, you know, and come up with a, two page list of all the stuff that you you're not good at and just look at that list and be totally intimidated. Like, where do I even start? How do I fix all of these things at once? Well, the answer is you can't, you have to chop that elephant up into, into bite-sized pieces and just, you know, pick the ones, the initial ones you want to start at and go, go for that. If you're doing it yourself, if you have a trainer or somebody more experienced, get them to advise you what the best things to start on are because a lot of times that list is sort of interconnected if you fix one 
thing on that list, it might fix others just automatically. So that's where an experienced person uh, can can help you sort through that that overload problem. Um, yeah, it's sort of finding those uh, master cues uh, to give someone, you know, so like in barbell training, the master cue is, you know, uh, keep balanced over your midfoot, right? Mm -hmm. Because when somebody conceptualizes that and starts acting on it, it starts correcting their knee position, starts correcting their hip position, starts correcting their back position, and they can easily see, you know, where the path of the barbell needs to be traveling as they do a squat or whatever. And I, I think fighting has a lot of those as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, just very does, simple cues that cover a lot of stuff without burying them in hyper specific terminology that like, yep. you know, doesn't matter for even really advanced fighters. A lot of the time, like, no, you don't need to worry about this super specific thing, you know, it's, or yeah, this is, <laughs> you're not there yet. We don't need to talk about that issue, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's this broader one. You'll be fine. There's, you know, um, so yeah, working on sure. those master cues, both being able to receive them and identify what those are and, and being able to tell people those. And that's just part of the learning process too. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. It is. And if you ever get a coach or, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bess. You're up. I don't want to do it anymore. No, you go ahead. <laughs> um, having seen this many, many times, and it's never inappropriate to say to somebody who is flooding you, to say, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble sorting all this out what do you think is the most first important or maybe first two important things I should be working on just so that I know I can remember them. Cause I've, I've personally experienced being flooded and I walk away with nothing. I don't even get one thing out of there that I can remember or sort out because it's just confusing. Um, so don't be shy in saying, admitting like, okay, my brain's full or I'm having trouble processing now, you know, give me, give me a good takeaway or just one thing that I can focus on. And you can actually, as a student, you can teach a coach that way because that is their reminder of, okay, now you're giving a, their, your student too much. Um, and, and coaches need to learn that. I needed to learn that as an instructor and as a coach, and it's invaluable. And then you will start to see as well as a coach when people's eyes start spinning in their head because they haven't said anything, but you can tell like they just are not tracking what you're, what you're, thrown out there. And that's, uh, that's a good skill to build as a coach to, to feel out your student to know when they're processing and when they're kind of churning away on what you're showing them and making progress and when they've hit a wall and they're not, they're not there anymore. Um, so I would really, like to, go to ahead, add go to ahead. that actually. So mm -hmm. uh, earlier sometime in history during COVID, so, you know, last week, we did an episode on how to be a good student, but also how to be a good coach. Uh, one of the things that we said for students was to uh, actively share with the coach that this, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when your brain is full, um, when if you've got an issue today, like uh, I'd like to focus on this with you today, but you need to know that my shoulder is sore. So please keep in mind that that might affect my arms, but it won't necessarily affect my footwork. Mm -hmm. so, and if you say that ahead of time, then the coach can say, okay, I'm aware of that. I am one of those people, y'all know, I'm one of those people that gets get overloaded easily. I can hear three things at practice. If you tell me a fourth, the, thir the first one falls out of my brain. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think most people are like that because you tell them something, they're trying to incorporate it, then you, you're working with them, you tell them something else. And it's almost like they forget to also still incorporate the, the first one. And it's understandable because it's new to them. And then you bring in the damn third thing and they are like, okay, you know what? Okay, three is enough. For me, three is the right number. For some people, two or even one might be the right number. So for coaches who are watching, it's important for us to um, be aware of and, and talk to our students as well. Like. Are you okay? Do you want to go further? How do you feel about this? Uh, and really listen to what, what your students are telling you. So that, that's really super important. I, I don't like the idea of you know, seeing eyes glaze over. Like, I want to tell you everything I've learned for 30 years of fighting. This is going to be great. And they're like, 
so I step forward right you know ultimately that is not helpful and as Tristan says they walk away uh, they aren't any smarter and you have done nothing to help them so in that instance you have failed as a coach so I really do believe in back and forth good communication uh, and if your brain is full you say that's all I can do right now you know I just need to practice what you told me um, and you just tell them Sir Best said so because that that is exactly the way I am. Well, and to put it in terms of the, because I know we're talking about choosing your own path of, of your fighting. One of the things that I've seen a number of times are people that they want to learn the fighting part and they think that they will succeed by doing that, by having many in-depth conversations where the concepts and fundamentals they need to be working on are described to them. And they memorize the list, they memorize what they're told, and they can repeat it. The problem is they spent so much time talking about it that their body can't do it. It's one thing to, to hear these, hear the concepts and fundamentals and tips and tricks and what whatever told to you and then memorize them. And that's an admirable feat in and of itself. But if you can't actually do any of them, you won't be a good fighter. You'll just be a good talker. Yeah, and, you're, a, uh, you're a great dictionary. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're an encyclopedia, but that's about all. Yeah. And and so I would say that that it would be a good mistake to avoid. It's re, it's better to get one or two fundamentals that you take, put them into your body, get that get it so that you can do those things, than to know two dozen of them that you can repeat and you can't actually do any of them. Absolutely, and it kind of ties in with the physical literacy a bit yes. in my brain too of being able to, you know, both being able to execute it against, say, a Pell, right, an mm -hmm. inanimate yeah. object, or or like a compliant opponent, right, who's like drilling with you, and right. then another to be able to uh, recollect it and then execute it in a yeah. in a moment in a in a real fight, right, or a, a practice fight. Um, so. Which is part of why the best cues and the best techniques are very simple, very effective, and, you know, with low risk and just, like, can be, they can, uh, like, so, like, in German longsword manuals, mm -hmm. uh, probably, like, half of the techniques are countercut, countercuts that are described, that got described to me once as oh shit techniques, mm -hmm. right? So, you're standing there and opponent thrusts at your body and it's this one that you can just, uh, you know, throw out very instinctively and then you have a couple plays that run from there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I kind of uh, that really resonated with me in a lot of ways. So sure. it's just this like both simple to execute has, you know, a specific outcome and is also easy to recollect and then deploy when the mm -hmm. moment comes to because um, that's the other part is both being able to do it and being able to do it at the right time. Right. Uh, exactly. Which is, you know, where practice and drilling and stuff like that comes in. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, there's a. a phrase that I came across years ago and I liked it so much that I painted it on the over the door of the wall of my dojo and that is knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle and that to me really described the mindset of when you go out to train you are training to take that knowledge of whatever it is you're working on and put it into your body so that it can execute um I I, I just I love it I loved how that just encapsulated that concept um we had a, a, a viewer here that has a really good question, and I admit that I have not come across. The question is, are there uh, many NCCP coaches in the SCA, and would that training be valuable? Um, and as I understand it, NCCP is uh, basically sport coaching. Uh, it's an association of, of sport coaches. Okay. Well, coaching an, an athlete, if you're experienced with it, the content this, it's the structure, I think, that would be helpful to know how to, how to take an athlete through a succession of drills and training methods to get them to an ultimate goal. The idea that you have that approach would be helpful. You know, if it's the fundamentals of basketball being different than the fundamentals of SCA fighting, if you don't know what the specific nuances of SCA fighting are over basketball or some other, you know, volleyball or whatever, at least you would have a methodology and you could probably go and learn those things. Um, I'd say that the SCA, if anything, is 
has for a long, long time been lacking that structure of how to teach SCA fighting to, to fighters. And that's something in the last 10 years, there's been great improvement on. You guys even last 15, 20 years. Um, but there's still wide areas of the SCA that really don't have much for active coaching or the or taking people through a, me a methodology of, of improving their yeah. fight. Um, but that's a, a good comment. And, and I think it's for anybody that that wants to teach uh, or is interested in having other people learn, learning coaching is is absolutely okay. crucial. And which is again, why we put this, uh, why we put this group together, SCA Co Coaches Corner, because we felt there was a, there was a, a demand for it. People were interested. And, um, and I think we hit, we hit the mark on it because we've gotten a lot of comments from people that were either won a Royal tournament or got knighted. And they're like, yeah, I, I by taking this mindset of how to improve myself and doing it in a, in a uh, using a method to do it really helped. So, you know, it, it does improve. And I think the structure is the same for any sport, uh, anything you want to get better at doing it in a, uh, with good method and, and process is better than just going out and doing it, hoping you're going to get better just naturally. It'll make it so much more efficient and rewarding along the way. Yep. Um, you know, you can you can either mess around and hope you get it, hope you get it right by chance for 12 years, right? Or you can do it the right way and make the same, if not more progress in two years, right? Um, exactly. And I don't I don't know of anybody that, that has ever enjoyed wasting their time. Yeah. Like working at something to get no real result or no measurable progress. Um, I suppose unless they're crazy and there's a lot of that going around too. Um, <clears throat> um, so the next point we have, I'll let Bess kind of have her little chuckle, uh, poor media choice. And I'm not sure exactly the media it says uh, what you're watching based on size, weight, uh, build athletic uh, ability. I guess what I would relate this to is seeing somebody who's built entirely unlike you and you go i want to fight like they do and then you try it and you have you aren't getting very good results put it that way and you may not have the experience to understand why what's working for that other person is not working for you and that could be something like well they're just crazy strong they got strong hands and strong arms and and they use that um, to affect or they've got really good footwork because their feet are fast or and yours are not, um, all kinds of things can enter into, you know, you putting on yourself on a path that may not be realistic for, for what your particular traits are. Have either of you seen, ever seen that happen? God, yes. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> anybody seen my rant a, a couple of weeks ago about short fighters right. knows that, uh, classic. Not only that that's a best classic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think that is something that many new fighters come out with and, you know, or they are inadvertently um, set up to fail because as I say, you know, somebody six foot four says to me, well, Bess, you know, just throw a scorpion over the top of their heads. And I'm like, you're fucking with me, right? Because I can barely hit their heads. Mm -hmm. So that sets, it up, sets people up for failure and disappointment. And if we're talking as we as we hope to for newer fighters on this one, you must pick people who look similar to you, or otherwise you are setting yourself up for failure and disappointment. Why can't I hit those shots that you know uh, the really super tall guys can? Or why can't I, you know, shield snatch the hell out of everybody like that big burly guy can? And being disappointed. Uh, because of unconscious goals and unconscious expectations is a really good way to drive yourself out of the SCA. And we would really like you to stay, please. Uh, I think fighting is a ton of fun. I'd like to think that you guys do as well. Uh, so staying in, staying, God help me, engaged uh, is super important. And I, I have seen that uh, on more than one occasion. And as I say, it's a recipe for disaster. Why? Would you want to come out if every time you go out and do the thing, you feel bad afterwards? That that's, doesn't make sense. I'd rather stay home and weed my garden 
you know, and I can see some something positive at the end of my hard work for, for we do my garden or going to the gym, um, then going and doing something, whatever it is that makes me feel terrible over and over again. If you're feeling terrible be, and you're like, I don't know why, I just feel like I really suck. I would suggest that what you're facing is an unconscious expectation set up by possibly looking at somebody, comparing yourself to somebody, wanting to be somebody when you're not them. You're you. You have to be the best you that you, you can be. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just said that. That is such a platitude. But it's also really I'm, true. I completely agree with it, though, right? Uh, it's the same like we were talking about earlier, right? You know, well, what's your goal? Where, well, to win crown. It's like, well, what does that mean? If you win, are you done? If you don't get it, are you done? So all the best you can do is just try to make yourself into the best fighter you possibly can and then run from there, right? Mm -hmm. And that might be like you might taper out at one point and just be fine with that or, you know, or whatever. But I think that's a, a, a more healthy mindset, you know, mm -hmm. certainly. And, and, uh, and getting back to the media options, you know, looking at being – thoughtful and cognizant about what you know youtube channels or tiktok channels or whatever you're watching are these people influencers going for views um are they showcasing tricks right so like in the calisthenics world there's a handful of really good training channels out there like calisthenics movement and fitness faqs where they're breaking down movements they're breaking down fundamentals and principles and stuff right and uh you know, they're constantly reiterating the basics again and again and again. And then occasionally they showcase cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But then there are channels that are just there to show the cool stuff, right? They, they're just there to show the like, oh, here's my cool one arm muscle up, you know, or, or this like, you know, this style of backflip into a planche or whatever. And then just throwing that out there. So being aware of are they you know, there to educate or are they there to show off, which both can be fine. And you can get a lot of inspiration out of that. And kind of seeing that with what fighters you look at too, mm -hmm. to a certain degree, you know, do you want to fight like that person because they're successful or just because they look cool while doing it either can be fine, but you should be aware of that and know why there's definitely been fighters that inspire me. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if what they do is necessarily literally the most successful thing possible, but damn, if it looks cool. So I'm going to, you know, try to emulate that a little bit, but, you know, just being aware of what it is that you're seeing in these people or, you know, these media influencers and, uh, and, uh, what you're getting out of it and what they're putting out. Yeah. Sure thing. Oh, go ahead. Like, best. That, like if they're stinky fighters, but you know they're they're king of their practice so they're like well i'm king of my practice so i'm going to post all my videos but they they're doing stuff that wouldn't work in reality uh outside of their local group if you're watching that stuff then you might find yourself having difficulties with that as well so yeah. maybe you're also watching crappy fighters it's a possibility yeah yeah yep. uh, uh one thing I, that that and this plays right back into the mental game of Okay, so let's say you are in your in your practice or local area, no one is built like you. And so you could easily think, well, I don't have any any example. There's nobody that's built like me. I'm now stuck. I'm doing this all myself. Don't think of it that way because I've found, and this is just my own mindset, I love stealing techniques from people um, and even people that are not built like me. And I'll, I'll just, as an experiment, say, you know what? They did this one particular thing really well. I'm going to just, for a practice, I'm going to try that out. Or maybe for a couple of practices, I'm going to try it out. I may look like a complete idiot. I may fail utterly at it. But I'll give it a whirl just as an experiment and see how it goes. And of the times I've done that, sometimes it doesn't work. But if I usually have found something that somebody else uses, I can usually get it pretty kind of close to making it work unless there's some really extraordinary physical limitation. And I remember one, um, and I've seen a few fighters do this. They're yeah, just got incredible forms and they'll, they'll put their, their, you know, go in this like St. George's or, or hanging guard and just go, boom, they just put their hand forward and it sort of just slams right into your helmet. They can do that because they have extraordinary strength. So like that, I've never even tried. But usually when you have some kind of a movement set up or some kind of a, um, a technique that, that uses a particular st style of movement, 
try emulating it just just as an experiment don't put your all of your hopes and desires into mastering that particular technique it might not work out but i found that that was one of the most fun things about the sca and about fighting was when i watched somebody do something pretty amazing i was like can i do that or can i try doing that and i would try it out and you know sometimes i could i maybe not make it work but i get close enough to go okay i can see the value of what they're doing here i need to spend time flushing it out to get it to the level that they did or or even close but it would be time well spent and you can find out pretty quickly when okay this is not going to work i'm not this is i, I know there's no way this is going to work for me at all i'm not even going to try but i've i've found that that's more in the minority than in the majority um yeah. And so definitely steal technique whenever you get a chance. And that's where learning to do fight analysis is going to be so important. Um, because if you can't watch and analyze what other people are doing, you may never even see it. And you yeah. can see some wondrous things when you when you build your eyes to be able to, to perceive it, to comprehend it. Well, um, that's, a, that's a super important part, too, is knowing the the why and the how of a technique rather than just focusing on the technique itself. On the why, yeah, and, exactly. You know. Uh, Sir Alexander said our practice has just an absolutely wicked spin shot. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just the spin shot. The magical part of it to me is the timing and placement of it, right? Yeah. It's done in a very specific way. So when, you know, it was like my, my old knight, he was saying, you know, well, why don't you just hit him when he does that? It's like, you don't understand. He's doing it with good enough time. You effing can't touch him. <laughs> like, yeah, and he knows yeah. it. <laughs> so I was throwing it there. Yeah. Right. So, you know, cause that's the other part is the why and the how behind it rather than just the, the, the move mm -hmm. itself. Well, I actually think you've hit a really good, uh, good point there, Nicholas. I think that we should emphasize that the why, why does this work? It works because of X, Y, or Z, or Z for my American friends, X, Y, or Z. <laughs> and that way, if, if the, if I can't do it exactly the thing has been explained to me, if I know why it works, then I can try to figure out some way to replicate the part that I can't do so, so that I can make it work. So yep. once you understand the, it works because I have momentum say, does momentum have to come from this or can I get the momentum to come from something else? So long as there's momentum and yep. that gives you something to, to try. And I think that's super important, Nicholas. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that kind of brings us to our next point. I think we've touched on this a, a, a number of point, a number of, times in this episode already of having a positive user experience. And that's going to be, I guess, like most of life in how, what your attitude and your own mindset is. Um, with SCA fighting or with any, any endeavor, if you go in thinking, oh, this is a chore, I'm going to have to work my butt off and this is miserable and I don't like being hot and sweaty or what, you know, the more you're just building the bricks of the house of your own misery versus i'm excited to to learn something i'm excited to try something else new because you might strike something that really works for you um one of the big ones is finding and this is another trap i think it's a mental trap of oh i just got hit and and i've found there's a hole in my fighting something that I, i'm making these drastic dreadful mistakes and people are taking advantage of it and initially that stings. Personally, I learned to love those because without that, you will have that hole forever. And sooner or later, you, somebody's gonna find it. The sooner they find it, the sooner you know about it and the sooner you can get to fixing it. Yeah. So don't look at that. Look at that as an opportunity, not as a, as a failure. It's something that every fighter has to deal with. The, the fighters who do the best at it take it of, you know what, I'm taking that that opportunity away from my opponent. I'm not giving it to them anymore. And I'm going to find out how to solve this thing. And again, use others to help you. Uh, if you uh, are having trouble figuring out how to deal with it, uh, break it down into what makes it work, how does it work, and then form your plan for all right, how am I going to overcome this? Like, that's kind of the fun of the S of SCA learning SCA fighting and becoming a better fighter. That's the process. I think Sean talks about that a lot is the process of, you know, you go to go to a tournament, you find out where your deficiencies are, you go back into training, 
you say, all right, I'm putting these at the top of my list. We're taking care of these deficiencies and we're going to flush them out and remove them. And then you go and show yourself what you've learned and that they're not there anymore. And there's always going to be a few more, but you know, it's not a quick process, but it is a process. Um, but I think that that's part of having that positive you positive experience is viewing it as being this is something that is building you up it's making you stronger better um a tougher opponent more competent and capable that should feel good to you it's not a downside of you know oh my god i'm not perfect i suck i'm never going to be good at this you know we've all heard that guy talking in our head you know just don't shut him off and go on to the all right, this just give me a clear plan of what I need to deal with, what I need to take care of. And... Oh, I, I'm gonna sorry, I'm just gonna jump in on that. You make me you make me laugh, Tristam. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to say that, like Tristam, I learn from my mistakes, but apparently, unlike Tristan, I also get mad at myself. I do think I suck, and then I get mad again because now I should have been better. <laughs> And then I get to the, to the point where I can learn. It's not always a case of, hmm, my leg hurts me a great deal. I'm aware that I'm going to have a bruise there tomorrow. I have learned now that I have a hole there. Usually it starts off with, geez, Louise, just walk it off. I, I wish I was that academic. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not. Yeah, I, I want to point out, it's not that, you know, we're like, I want to be very clear. Well, I may ultimately, you know, be get to the point of doing an analysis of my from my mistakes. There's a whole lot of swearing and owing and being pissed off at myself that I got hit initially before I get there. And because I do it, I'm going to say that's okay. You can do that too. You don't have to be, you know, all calm and cool and analytical right off the bat well um, and i'll admit too that it's not it's not that calm and cool it's like oh no that ain't happening again uh-uh uh that's going right to the top of the list baby i'm going to fix this pdq so it's we all have a kind of a but maintaining a somewhat positive dialogue and a productive one versus a you know oh am i ever going to be good at this or i, I don't know maybe this is it you know if i hit the ceiling that sort of stuff you got to take off the table. Yeah. And it's to me, that's where some of the, like that plowman's mentality, that blue color work ethic comes back into play a little bit too. Right. Is like, yes, it should be fun broadly, but over time, right. Cause there will be moments that hurt oh, yeah. or frustrating or make you angry. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, it's not going to always be cocaine and roller coasters. Right. Sometimes it's just going to be, slow is steady like it's not you know literally every time you step out the field you put your helmet on you're like oh, fuck yeah and you like go out and it's like the funnest thing ever no it's not gonna be that there'll be times where your armor feels hot and itchy and you smell and like you're tired and you're in pain mm -hmm. but you still take that long-term satisfaction with mm -hmm. it right so it's things can be satisfying over time without them you know being fun and that's that's just a part of being a good you know lifelong learner too yeah. is uh taking the bad with the good and learning how to how to work with that and roll with it and turn it into something else positive and just you know mm -hmm. yeah i got beat up tonight but there's you know six more practices this month and you know we've got time to just keep getting better and internalizing that and finding joy in the process rather than in the result was a big thing for me mm -hmm. um because you know you can't 100 percent confirmly confirm or confirm that you will win any given tournament, right? So you have to find the satisfaction outside of that. And uh, right. yeah, that's where some of this just grind mindset. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and savor your victories, even the, the small ones. I yeah. mean, because it, you're still making progress. You're still advancing, advancing on and improving. Um, one of the last points we had on here, uh, which was lack of encouragement. And that's um, that's something where that encouragement can actually be coming from yourself too. If you're so, if you beat yourself up so badly that you cannot accept that you did any, anything well, like you, you can have a fight or a tournament where you did, you know, eight or nine things really good and made two or two mistakes and walk away thinking, I just screwed up. I don't know why I'm bothering doing this anymore. <laughs> be realistic about, okay, here are the couple of things that I did wrong that I need to address. 
but I also have to address these seven or eight things that I did well that six months ago I wasn't doing well. You know, I was maybe doing two or three. So be careful about your, I guess they'd call it the self-talk, uh, but about how, how hard you are on yourself. Be kind. Be as kind to yourself as you would be to one of your students who you don't want to let them go down the path of depression or of discouragement. Yes, you, you, you're not, you know, blowing sunshine up their skirt. You have to be realistic about, okay, here are the positives. Here are the, here are the deficiencies. Let's work on the deficiencies. Let's make sure we don't forget about the stuff you're doing right consistently. Take stock and these things are going well. And that, you know, there will always be that balance of the good and the bad. And you're all, they're always going to be juggling from kind of one hand to the other. Um, but if, and I will just say this too, that if you have a coach or a mentor that is constantly beating you down, you know, and usually I call these the drill instructor type approach methods, uh, you know, screaming at you or, you know, berating you all the time, realize that your confidence is, is a factor of, of your skill and ability. If you have, let's say a, a level seven out of 10 physical ability, but you think you're a three, really you're about a five just because of what your mind is set at. And if you've got somebody who's, who's beating up your mind, hope when the hopes of toughening you up, that may actually be an overall negative for you. So be careful that you're not with, with under a, a coach or a mentor who's too toxic. Um, and that can happen. It's not very common, but it, you know, it can. Um, and I know it is very old school to, to, you know, berate students and, and whatnot to, with the hopes of sparking a fire in them to fight back and resist, um, and to prove the, the, the mentor wrong. But I, I think that that's, we found out better about psychology, of, about what it takes to excel at, a, at, at, uh, an athletic endeavor and confidence is one of those things that is, is a necessary component. And I know Bronis has talked about that quite a bit and it's, it's tangible. It's not an intangible thing. Um, there's a very tiny percentage of people that do improve under such guidance. Uh, and for the rest of them, it's, they'll often get discouraged and, and kind of, and want to quit. Um, do you, either you have any, comments about experiences or experiences about encouragement and, and how it's either been for you or that you've seen people take a jump in their abilities because of the encouragement they get. Um, one thing along those lines is recognizing that if you're going to the same practice, say, you know, probably most fighters go to one practice a week, right? So mm -hmm. if you're going to the same practice with mostly the same fighters every single week, you not necessarily if you don't beat them more right week to week that doesn't mean that you're not improving right and that can be really hard to visualize you know at like at our practice we're really blessed it's you know you know there's like seven nights at it and uh mm -hmm. duke's fan um so it's it's a pretty deep practice and sometimes it can feel hard i, I especially imagine as a newer fighter to you know and visualize your progress mm -hmm. um so that's where some of the like internalizing your goals and not necessarily viewing it just as raw wins losses although that can be useful and i brought it up earlier mm -hmm. right but sometimes it has to be more like uh goal personal goals right and personal victories and stuff like that mm -hmm. um because again if you're going you know say you're all improving two percent every practice all of you are improving 2% every practice and you might never see like a, a super tangible difference when it's right. happening. Right. And, and, and that's why you need a, a tune up every once in a while where you go to a different practice and, you know, maybe go beat up on some other squires or whatever. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, we had a, a user comment here and this actually reminded me of a, of a young fighter years ago that I was working with and uh, the, 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 Viewers comment is, I admit sometimes I'm, I'm too hard on myself and have issues accepting compliments. Um, that's one thing, this young man that, that was, he was a squire and he was aspiring to knighthood and, and he, he was one of our hot squires in the kingdom. 
and you know he was out traveling around and fighting knights and stuff like that and and he whenever he'd fight a knight and a knight would compliment him say wow that was you know really good fight or wow you just beat me up or you know whatever he would he would so hard on himself he'd say well you know i, I didn't yeah i just got lucky or I, I didn't really deserve that or something of that and like a self-deprecating kind of approach and you know i advised him and said you know you don't have to say that you earn you you hit you hit that night you you beat him you know if he says wow you did a good job just say thank you very much i feel like i was having a good day you know you earned it don't don't make because I, I this is what I told him. I said, chances are that knight probably didn't really care for getting beat by a squire, because that's <laughs> kind of how it goes down, right? Yeah. If he thinks, if you tell him you just you feel like you just got lucky and that he didn't deserve it, he'll probably believe it. But why lie to him? You know that you earned, you trained hard, you got better, you got to the point level of skill where you, you know, did a better job than he did in, in that moment. Yep. If he compliments it on you, don't steal that away from yourself. Your and, uh, your luck had to be there at the right time right. to take advantage like you, your of your timing was on. Your, yeah, yeah, those things were clicking, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't apologize. Don't feel like you had to apologize for it. And uh, he, I'm going to jump in on that one too, because yeah. if someone is giving you a compliment, we're not your mom. We don't have to tell you you're smart and pretty and strong. You know, your mom might have to do that, but we don't. Mm -hmm. We're doing it because it's the truth. Now, mm -hmm. you might feel that you have, you know, you, as Tristan said, you have to say, oh, I was lucky because you need to be modest. The SCA has, I think, confused um, any acceptance of, uh, of acknowledgements of skills or ability is, as hubris, overwhelming pride, which is, mm -hmm. you know, one of the seven deadly sins. It's not wrong to say, thank you. I've mm -hmm. been working on that. I'm pleased it worked. You're not saying, yeah, man, I kicked your butt. You sucked up. <laughs> your all. What you're saying is, thank you. I've worked, I've worked on it. Mm -hmm. If you're wondering if, if your concern is, uh, why are, are they saying this to me to, uh, to get me to come out more, mm -hmm. uh, they saying this to you know just make me feel better. No, no, you're a grown up. We're grown ups. We might do that with little kids, but we don't do that with grown ups. Uh, constructive criticism or compliments are exactly that. They're there to help you. Uh, so please don't ever think that someone giving you a compliment, um, it, they're telling you a lie for whatever reason. They're trying to trick you or make a fool out of you because that's what your brain will tell tell you. Uh, that's not the case. You may not see the improvement in you, but other people have, or people who you fight with regularly have seen the improvement and they're going to say it to you. After uh, 30 odd years of fighting, lo fighting longer than <laughs> Nicholas has been alive, I still find myself getting tired of practices or not being able to do what I want to do but I know I am considerably better than when I started 30 years ago. Or as Nicholas was saying, you know, at practice, I too, hopefully am getting better every practice. So I feel like I started off tired at the end of practice and I am still just that tired, but it takes a lot more to get me there. So yeah. I just wanted to say that, please, if someone is telling you something that you've done well or that you've done a good job, there is no need for false modesty. There's nothing wrong with saying, thank you. I was pleased with that. I've been working on it. Or even just as my mom would tell me, you just say, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've gone about uh, about 90 minutes. So let's wrap it up and I'll leave it to uh, to Nick. We'll, we'll actually go with him for any final thoughts you have on, on this topic. Who? Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I just can't really uh, reiterate enough how important it is to have a uh, a plan both a long-term plan a mid plan and a short-term plan um and knowing the whys behind it and then from there you can start building the foundations and a progression plan over time on how you're going to get there right and so don't really be scared of taking pride and joy in the short-term goals for me that's really what keeps me going uh, kind of that lifelong learner attitude rather than getting your, you know, yourself all psyched up for the big tournament and then being either depressed or on cloud nine for a week after the tournament. 
having a much more sustainable headspace, right? There's a, uh, a 14th century medieval knight, uh, Fiore de Liberi, who says that it takes 20 years to make a master of law or of medicine or of religion, but it takes 30 years to make a master swordsman, I believe is what he says. And I think that's a little, little hyperbolic, but even say it's 10 to 20 years, right? It's a long haul to get there. And you have to enjoy the process if you're going to really, really enjoy sticking around, right? Because you have to be on your game for, you know, a long time. And uh, that's really what it's about. So making it less, um, I guess I, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I think about it is, is be in it for the long haul, enjoy the process and uh, think about the whys behind what you're doing and try to be logical and patient about it. Definitely. Bess. So I'll say to you what I say to my work colleagues, you make the plan, you execute the plan, you evaluate the plan, and then you change as necessary. Don't be afraid to change your plans. If you've been, if you're saying, you've been saying to yourself, I want to do this, or I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to do X or Y. Uh, if you can't, it's okay to, to take a step back to evaluate and say, I'm going to, come at it from a different angle. It's okay to change your mind with more information. And, and you will, you can count on that. <laughs> as the path, as you go along the path, you'll always alter it a little bit to suit where you're at and what you want to do. Well, this has been a, a very good conversation. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much. And thank you to everybody, the listeners who offered up their comments and questions. Um, Next week's episode is Knights and uh, MODs under 30. So this is for those uh, rare few who have who've done really well at being very young and, and getting to, you know, peer, peer caliber fighters <clears throat> at a very young age. Uh, so looking forward to that episode. I believe Sean's going to be hosting that one. Um, so definitely drop by for next week's episode. And until then, thank you both for, for coming tonight. And thank you all for listening. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Yep. Have a good night.